Amen. And right now we have Carol to come and sing for us. I have seen the ruined lives of millions burned by sin. I have seen those in the ghetto with a bottle in their hand. But I know this could be me. I could be in that same place, but I'm washed. And I'm redeemed. I thank God for grace. Unworthy of mercy, yet I'm free and saved. Unworthy of royal blood that flows through my veins. Not for Calvary, where would I be today? I was blind, now I see. I thank God for grace. Nothing good have I done to deserve this holy place. For I was lost as I could be When his hand reached way down The once I had nothing I now have everything Oh, I thank God for grace To save a wretch like me Unworthy of mercy, yet I'm free and saved. Unworthy of royal blood that flows through my veins. If not for Calvary, where would I be today? I was blind, now I see. I thank God for grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our the Lord. Let me make a, a little announcement here. Uh, Pastor Jerry Cook has a fall preachers meeting pretty much every year and this time uh, he's going to have a special speaker in Bill Grady. He'll be with us on Wednesday night and then uh, he'll be with Jerry Sunday night and Monday night the following that Wednesday night. So uh, Jerry's going to have a meal at 5.30 up there, Pastor Cook, and the evening service at 7 o'clock. Uh, Pastor Enoch will bring in what he calls the long van, 
And uh, we'd like to have some people go up. If you'd like to go, it'd be great. So that's be September 30th. And we have Fifth Sunday Sing uh, the, on the Sunday night, but uh, that'd put us a little late getting up there. But um, anyway, Monday, some of us will be going, and we'd love to have others come too. Be a good time. Uh, Pastor Cook has got himself into a new building. They merged with another church, and he's got a nice building. He never owned the building before, so he's the pastor of the merger. It's, uh, it's the church, and he's been renting for 17 years. So it's very good. He's very happy and love to have us come up. All right, tonight, uh, I'm going to get you back that 10 minutes you lost this morning. Father, we pray as we look to thy word again tonight, God, that you would be lifted up, that, that saints would be edified. God, thank you for this precious word that we have, the great commission that you've given to us. And what a privilege, what an honor that we are ambassadors for Christ. We thank you for it. Ask you to bless us. We look to thy word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk about the profile of a soul winner tonight. And there are several great examples in the scriptures of people being converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, immediately my mind goes to the woman at the well, John chapter 4. Uh, somebody called it the well, the water, and the woman, where Jesus led that lady to Christ. She was a Samaritan and told her everything, you know, just a great example over there in chapter 4. And you couldn't get a better example in Jesus, that's for sure. And again, I think of the great story of the Ethiopian eunuch being converted under the ministry of Philip in Acts chapter 8, just to name a couple that completely, that immediately come to mind. But tonight I'd like to go to the great apostle Paul, who was an amazing Christian. He was uh, both a theological marvel and a soul winner. I mentioned this morning that a lot of your theologians are not soul winners, and a lot of your soul winners are not necessarily theologians. They're not necessarily great writers or anything like that, they're rambunctious people. They get out there and just uh, go like a house of fire, so to speak, and never quit. And they're great men. And then sometimes the other guys are the bookworms. And Paul was both. Paul uh, wrote our church doctrine under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And there might be a good example of uh, what we kind of emphasized this morning, I hope and think, is that we need to put out effort. And at the same time, your effort is no good. Christ said, without me, you can do nothing, over in John 15. Uh, we are nothing and can do nothing. But when we look at the inspiration of the uh, scriptures and the fact that the writers were inspired with the words of God, I think it's some kind of an example of how human instrumentality works with God's sovereignty. Because we say, Paul wrote it. Yeah, he did. But then God was doing the writing. And yet he used the apostle Paul. So I think there's some parallel there with soul winning. Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 16? Acts chapter 16. Very familiar examples over here. And we'll begin in verses 9 and 10. And there the Bible says, Acts chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. Seems funny when the kids leave, doesn't it? Maybe not from where you're sitting, but where I'm standing, it looks different. They're working on a Christmas something. I think it's a play, a musical. What do you call a musical play? A musical? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And no, it's not a cantata. I asked, but I was expecting the correct answer. Okay, thank you, Sergeant. It's good to have you back in the house. All right, chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia. We, in our song, Rescue the Perishing, we've heard the, oh, that was Send the Light, I guess. Yeah, we heard the Macedonian call. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us 
for to preach the gospel unto them. You know, in Acts chapter 8, don't bother to go back there, but when God uh, told Philip to go speak to that Ethiopian eunuch, he ran to meet him in the chariot. I haven't lifted that out of context, have I? Don't worry, we're still getting out of here in plenty of time, despite these little dalliances of mine. He said, go near and join thyself to his chariot, and Philip ran through the to him. When God told him to go, he started running, you know, not reluctantly dragging his feet or anything. And we get over here, and um, he said immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. So they're not crossing the Bosphorus over there, but they're going from Asia over to Europe. Macedonia is that northern part of Greek, which under Philip the Macedonian, father of Alexander, this is Greek territory. They're going over there. And the call to come over and help us is not an original call for Paul to go into the ministry. He's already in the ministry. He's already on his missionary journey. But it's more of the specific leading of the man of God to cross from Asia into Europe into Macedonia and crossing the Aegean Sea to go over and minister there. So my point there is, all right, we're saved, we're serving the Lord. But there are times when he can particularly direct you for a particular specific purpose within that ministry. And you've heard people say that, I just felt like God was leading. And then at times things work out very well. So we don't ever want to eliminate God from the equation, amen? I mean, I, I know that sounds like a stupid thing, but we don't want to get so busy with our own program or what we figure we got to do that if God directs us or God changes our way a little bit, See, Paul was forbidden to preach in Mysia, uh, Bithynia. The Holy Ghost wouldn't let him go to certain places. So he's going westerly. Peter Ruckman says the gospel's moving west and uh, has always moved west. So they're going westerly and heading over there. And they were not allowed to go north up into that region as they passed through Asia. And then God called him to go over to Macedonia and the gospel moved west. So big things are about to happen. He's going over, he's going to end up in Philippi. And big things are going to happen there. So we look at 9 and 10, and we review the call. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So... People have always questioned, how do you know the will of God in your life? Okay? Well, you know it's the will of God to get saved. He's not willing that any wouldn't, to paraphrase. He'd have all men to come to Christ. So you don't have to pray whether it's God's will that you accept Christ. He's expressed that will to you. You don't have to pray about whether or not it's God's will to be baptized. He's already commanded every Christian to be baptized. So there's no question on some of those things. But whether you want to serve the Lord in Lamarada or in Noah, you know, and what church you want to go to and what God's called you to do specifically in your life, those things, yes. And we can, we can mull those over. But Paul says, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel to them. Now, I don't know what you do with visions. I know this, you've got to make sure no vision goes contrary to the word of God. And over in John chapter, well, over in 1 John, I think it is, yeah, you know, the Bible says, try the spirits, whether it be of God. And we've used the little cliche from time to try, time. Always try the spirits by the word. Don't ever try the word by the spirits. If some spirit comes and tell you, tells you that Jesus is not Lord, you know that was the devil speaking to you. Hopefully that's not going to happen to you. Amen? So, review the call. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we don't want to be jumping from pillar to post. 
We ought not be just meandering around through life. We ought to have some idea God can change our course at any age. God's called older men into the ministry. God's called older men and women to the mission field. So all of those things can happen. But at some point, we've got to have our hearts settled on what we're doing until God absolutely directs us otherwise. And my point is this. If a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, if we're not sure of what we're doing, nobody else is going to be sure of what we're doing. And Paul had a certain confidence and assuredness that God was in it. So he went. Now I want to look at three conversions here. Number one, in verses 13 and 14. Okay? He ends up in Philippi. Verse 13 and verse four, uh, 12. Verse 13, And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the woman which resorted thither. So we went, we sat down, and we spake. And the Bible continues there. So you say, well, what? we went, we sat down, and we spake. Look, how complicated is it? One of the things we said about the, uh, the Great Commission, and people have often said, I've heard it preached since forever, there's a go in the gospel. Okay? We're preaching here, we're studying the Bible, and that's great. That's fantastic. This is, this is our center for soul winning, if you will. But we've got to go somewhere. We've got to go and preach. We've got to go and tell them. So there's a go in the gospel. So Paul says he went, then he sat down. He engaged people. I could say that. Amen? Yeah. One thing to go, it's another thing to engage him. And we spake. We talked to him. And the Bible says this. A certain woman named Lydia, soul of purple in verse 14, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So I looked at that and said, All right. Here's the first conversion. Lydia, solar of purple, businesswoman. We went, we sat down, and we talked. And Lydia heard and attended unto those things which were spoken. And now Paul is blessed because she says, Come on over the house. So he's blessed. Then we move on to the next lady. Never says she's saved, but the demon's going to be cast out of her. It's a damsel with a spirit of divination. Verse 16, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masses much gain by soothsaying. So these guys had figured out she could tell the future. If you knew the future of the stock market, you could make a lot of money. So uh, they're making profit off this lady, this demon possessed. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now that's interesting at the, at the very least, that's very interesting, that a demon-possessed person is walking around and giving testimony to the Apostle Paul. Now, remember when the demons met Jesus, they knew who he was. Remember they fell down and, and, and like I said, Art thou come to torment us before the time? The demons know a lot of stuff. They know what's waiting for them. See, they're already under condemnation, but they know who Jesus is. And they're not messing with Jesus. But here, this spirit within her is testifying of Jesus. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I guess probably like us interrupting Pastor Enoch in his Sunday school class, Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when our masters saw that the hope of her, uh, their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceeding, exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to, re uh, re to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Go so at this point, okay, Alexander the Great's long gone, okay, 323 BC, somewhere around there. The Roman government's taken over. This is now a Roman colony. And they're saying, look, these guys are up here teaching us customs, which are unlawful. So the people that are fighting against Christ are going to say anything they can as long as it works. 
You talk about pragmatism. If it works, they'll use it. So they probably didn't care what the Romans said. I mean, I don't know that for a fact. I suppose possibly they did. But they're going to pull it out and play that uh, trump card, if you will, whenever they can. And the multitude rose up to gather against them. And the magistrates uh, rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So we got this lady here. She's demon-possessed in verse 16. She's by masters oppressed in verse 19. But Paul through the damsel, uh, but through Paul the damsel confessed. So we got possessed, oppressed, and confessed. And now Paul gets distressed because he gets beaten up over it. That's a damsel. Now we go on to the jailer. Verses 25 through 33. Now, verse 25, the Bible says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and every man, everyone's bands were loosed. Now that's interesting. God can do about anything he wants to in any way he wants to and he can do a good job of it, amen? If he wants to bring in an earthquake that knocks your handcuffs off, your shackles, he'll do it. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. So we've probably said often enough that the jailer's responsibility was to keep the prisoners. And if you lost them, you could be killed. I believe Herod the Great, uh, one of the Herods, uh, killed some guys when, um, I don't know which time it was. I don't know. I don't think it was when Peter got, got escaped. But other time, he came down and examined him and killed him. And when Paul was being transported to Rome, uh, the Roman soldiers said, we better kill him unless they escape. See, people didn't want to lose their prisoners. They could be held accountable. So this jailer says, man, everybody's out of here. Romans, who knows what they're going to do to me? I'm going to kill myself. Verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Wow, what a thing, huh? You know, we're talking about winning people to Christ. Can you imagine that somebody comes under conviction? Now, he'd seen Paul praying and praising. And nobody ran away. He's seen all kinds of things happen. He's seen the earthquake come and set them free. And he knows something's up. He's under conviction. And he comes in and falls down before him, says, what must I do to be saved? What an opening, all right? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So all kinds of good things happening. So I got this little thing here. Paul, while in jail, prayed and praised, verse 25. Then God wonderfully amazed, that's in the earthquake, verse 26. The jailer was frightfully faced, verse 27 through 29. And then he was spiritually rephrased at verse 30. He got baptized, he was saved, verses 31 through 33. So there you've got three people. Three, we said this is going to be, what did I say this was going to be? The profile of a soul winner. So you go over there to Philippi, and you've got three people saved in that city of Philippi. You've got Lydia. And they're all completely different situations, okay? He was in completely different situations all three times. Number one, there was a private businesswoman who attended. Number two, there was a demon-possessed damsel who contended. And number three, there was a government worker upended. So you got three different things going on there. And in the course of those three different situations, Paul was well-treated by Lydia, brought him into the house. Paul was severely beaten by the magistrates, and Paul was miraculously sweetened by God and the jailer. Everything is different, but here's what happened. Paul preached when they enlisted. He acted when they resisted, and he praised when they persisted. So he goes over there, and he gets a chance to preach to Lydia. They're listening. He preaches. Paul preached when they enlisted. Then he acted when they resisted. He's got that demon-possessed woman going at him like crazy. Boom. He casts the demon out. And then he praised when they persisted. So he's locked up, beat around. And I summarize this by cried out, cast out, and called out. Now, those are three great examples of how God moved and how Paul was used. They were all different situations and all different circumstances. 
Paul did not and could not approach each the same way. So you're dealing with this guy and you deal with him one way. You deal with this girl over here, you deal with him a different way. You're dealing with somebody that's 80 years old, you deal with them one way. You deal with somebody that's 13 years old, you may deal with them another way. You may deal with somebody that has a background in Roman Catholicism in a different way than you do that's got a background in Mormonism. Okay? All different situations. People aren't exactly the same. They've got the same problem. And I'll repeat what I said this morning. We must never forget we have the only solution to the biggest problem any person ever had. We've got to remember what we have and the value of what we have and the, the essential nature of what we have. They've got to have it. They don't have it. And nobody else has got the answer other than the Bible believing Christian. I didn't say I'm the only one that's got it to you. But look, the Mormons don't have it. The JWs don't have it. The Seventh-day Adventists don't have it. The Catholics don't have it if they have any hope in the Pope because there is no hope in the Pope. Okay? We've got to remember that always if we're going to care. If we think everybody's okay and all roads lead to Rome, and unfortunately a whole bunch of them do, but if we think that, then we're not going to worry about it. I have to realize, look, if this thing were not very important to me, I wouldn't be standing here. I would have got saved and dropped out of church or done whatever. Every one of us are here because we know the importance of it. Amen? That's why we're living the way we're living. We believe it, we embrace it, we know it's true, and we've got to keep that in our minds so we know that, look, I've got the solution that guy needs. You know, probably a lot of us have lost loved ones. How serious is that? We have the only answer. We've got to figure... You know, Paul said, I made all things to all men that I might by some means, all means save some. So here's an example of it right here. He did not and could not approach each the same way. There were vastly different people in settings. And Paul was masterful each time. But not at any time could he be successful without God stepping in. Now again, let's just revisit it ever so briefly. He's got a damsel that's possessed with a demon. Running around yakking. He casts the demons out of her. The demon. He's got a jailer. There's not demon possessed. Okay? He's not a believer. He's the jailer. Paul is just singing and praising God and everything. I don't know if he convinced the prisoners to stay there. You know, after they would get loosened. Uh, that is often preached that way. The Bible doesn't say a lot about it, but did Paul have that much of an effect? So, obviously, if he's praising God, that, that jailer is going to be hearing it. He's hearing the gospel somehow in the songs. We've got songs here full of the gospel, right? And I'm glad of that. Now, I'll leave it at that because we're going to get out on time. But see, they were different. And Lydia, they were happy to listen. He could sit down and preach a Bible message to Lydia. See? So they were all different. And he was masterful, but he couldn't do it without God. He couldn't cast a demon out without God. He couldn't bring an earthquake without God. And certainly, if everybody's willing to listen to you, that's God. God's brought you into a situation where people are willing to listen to the gospel. That's God. So the Holy Spirit had to be in it or nothing would have happened. Paul was smart, but Paul was not the answer God was. But God used Paul. Now look, Paul was faithful, Paul was patient, and God moved. I put those three P's that I scribbled down before. And Pastor Enoch wrote them down. But it had to do with something to do with preaching. What was it? Yeah, we had to have Bible passion. What was the next one? The determined perseverance and the power and the Holy Ghost power. Paul had those. 
He stayed with her. Look at what he went through, and he never lost his determination. We don't hear him in the jail saying, man, I was trying to do right, and look where it got me. I'm done with this. You know, he didn't do that. See? So, it was all working great. You say, man, that's great. Paul had it made. What a lucky guy. Let's remember that the time would come. No, he had more beatings than I've ever had. He spent, I don't know how many years in jail. Uh, you know, probably close to four or five years in jail. But the time would come in 2 Timothy 4, 6, where Paul would say, for I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now, when we have a departure, we're waiting to get on a plane, right, or a bus. Paul's departure was on the chopping block. He was going to have his head cut off at Rome. He said, I'm now ready to be offered. His life is an offering to God at that point. He was, he was, uh, it was a living sacrifice, amen, but now it's going to be a dead one. There would be no miracle, at least not of this world. God would not come and deliver Paul at that point from death. There was no wonderful story of salvation, at least that we know of. Maybe there was, but if so, it was not recorded. We don't have any great story of how the, the executioner was wonderfully converted or anything like that. Or that God broke the axe in half and it fell down and Paul walked away. Those things did happen. But they don't always happen. And they didn't happen to Paul at the end. It's appointed on a man once to die. And there are multitudes who will follow the path of destruction to their own souls. So here's Paul. We've looked at the profile of a soul winner. And we've given three wonderful examples of him going into Philippi and under different circumstances, just tremendously saving three people and say, hey, this is great. This is wonderful. Man, this is a picnic. Well, no, if it's a picnic, Paul ended up being the sandwich. Now, Paul is in Rome on the chopping block. He's going to die. And we don't have any record of some great salvation experience that took place at that time. Now, his testimony was great. Sometimes when he was under control, he said many have been saved because they've heard the gospel. And, you know, we preach the gospel. Some preach it out of contention. All of those things took place without said. No, no doubt. Not arguing against it. But I'm saying at the, on that day, the only deliverance Paul got was from this life into heaven. And we don't know of anybody that was saved. So multitudes are going to reject the gospel to the destruction of their own souls. They're not all going to be great stories at Philippi. You're not going to look at that and say, hey, that's easy, man. Bing, bing, bing. Lydia, the damsel, the jail. Hey, let's go. Yeah, let's go. But let's not think it's all going to fall into a place like that. Some days there are days of harvest and there are days of reaping. And uh, there are other days of sowing and, and watering. It's not always harvest time. Paul was the greatest or among the greatest. But his secrets consisted of faith, patience, and consistency all combined with godly wisdom. Paul won souls when he could. He never seemed to miss an opportunity when that was presented. When you say, well, what's the guy say? How do I, how do I, how do I practice the luxury I get? And, and don't we talk about often creating our own opportunities? I mean, whether it's business, whether it's at your job, whether it's raising your kids or whatever, you know, we're, we're developing things in such a way so that it presents itself properly. But we say Paul never seemed to miss an opportunity when presented, and he didn't. But I wonder how many times he's actually responsible for those opportunities. So Paul won souls when he could. Paul never seemed to miss an opportunity when presented, and Paul pressed on when it seemed like everything was at its darkest. And God saved souls, and he enriched Paul's life in the process even through suffering. Now, I don't want to suffer. I spent enough time in the dentist the last couple of days, I'm sick of it. Okay? I said, how are you doing? I said, great. 
I'm going to get beat up physically, I'm going to get beat, beat up emotionally, and I'm going to get beat up financially. Other than that, I'm doing fine. Isn't that about it? And I ran into one guy, I think he's saved. He, he could, have been, could have been Catholic, but one of the men down there was talking about speaking to churches over there and, you know, I mean, you're somewhere, any country you want to name over there. And he's having a great conversation with me. Don't you love that? What do you think, Pat? You're the full-time Pat? You're the senior Pat? Right? Great conversations. Anyway, how can I say Paul's life was enriched? Everything in the world went wrong with him. And yet, we know from Romans 5, tribulation works with patience, patience experience, right? Experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. For the love of God is shut abroad in our hearts. Look, while we're serving God, is it unfair of me or wrong of me to say that our life has been enhanced? Our quality of life is far better, despite whatever, whatever has gone wrong. Somebody called you a Bible thumper. Oh, no, that's too bad. Boy, compare that to those guys who were burned at the stake. Which of us have really been persecuted? None of us. I'm going to just say it. I haven't been beaten up for the cause of Christ. Somebody might have lost some friendships or somebody all of a sudden your old buddies don't want to talk to you anymore because you're preaching too hard to them. Okay, big deal. That's sort of not really persecution. And when we look at our life, the quality of our life, our husbands, our wives, our kids and everything like that, and everything we have in Christ, look, I'm going to say that God enriched Paul's life even through suffering. And I'm also going to say this. To some degree, that may be the soul winner's lot in life. But, because he suffered. But there was a crown of righteousness awaiting Paul because he loved Christ appearing. 2 Timothy 4 8. There was absolutely a crown of rejoicing granted to Paul as a faithful soul winner. 1 Thessalonians 2 19 says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? And not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. Paul said, Look, the greatest thing I have, and he speaks about this other times in his writings, but his joy is in these people that he's seen come to Christ. And talks about in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his appearing. Now just imagine how we're going to feel if we've had some part in somebody coming to Christ when we stand before Christ. Now, when I look at his appearing, I think of the second coming of Christ, of, of course. But as Christians, we'll be there at the judgment seat of Christ. And if you look over and see some guy that you led to Christ that's there uh, because God allowed you to be a part of the process and you give glory to God for that. But imagine that joy. And let's take it to our own children and say, man, if you see them growing up to serve Christ, Really, is there a greater joy? And some of you have little ones and you're praying hard for them to be saved when they reach an age of accountability. Why? You are acknowledging right now the great joy it is to see your children serve Christ. And if you don't believe it's a great joy to see your children to serve Christ, talk to somebody whose children are not serving Christ and see the heartbreak. That's a brief glimpse into the profile of a great soul winner. Shall we pray? God, thank you so much. God, what a great example Paul is. Of course, he's much more than that. He accomplished so much. He's so successful. But God, we can look to the Lord Jesus Christ and so many times, the great things he did. Sometimes we can say, well, that's not fair. He's God. Of course, he can do it. We look over and see Philip in that great story of how he ran to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch. And God was in it all the way. And he opened it where he was in Isaiah and preached Christ unto him. Spurgeon said, 
pick a verse and make a beeline to the cross. And then we go to the great apostle Paul. We're right there at Philippi. Bing, bing, bing. Three people, three unbelievable, quote unquote, awesome stories about salvation, about soul winning. And we see the wisdom, the skill, the godly dedication, and how God moved through Paul to change lives for all eternity. And we know it wasn't easy for Paul. We see that. Never see Paul weeping. Look, he says, henceforth was laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day. Paul was positive all the way. He'd been there before, literally. He'd been caught up to the third heaven. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was doing. He knew the value of what he was doing. And God, if we could appropriate some of those things into our life and keep them there, we've got families to take care of, we've got jobs, we've got to earn a living. But somehow, in it all, sometimes I like to say if we can put in a good word for Christ. Maybe if we say at the end of a staff meeting, God bless you guys, I love you. Say to somebody, hey, God loves you. Oh, you got a problem? I'll pray for you because God loves you. Maybe we can throw some of that in. Maybe a simple track. Maybe a word, fit word spoken in due season. God help us to be sold out to that concept. We're so fortunate to have been entrusted with such a great treasure the unsearchable riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. We humbly thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.